Hey there everyone and welcome back to my Kerbal Space Program videos. This is the second video of my series of historical progression in Kerbal Space Program. And let's just have a look at the Space Center here. It looks a bit different from last time. At the bottom of the screen you'll notice there's some green arrows and what they're used for is to progress time without having to do it on the launch pad which is incredibly useful for planning trips to other planets because it means that you don't need to have a have a rocket on the launch pad and speed time up which often results in the death of your kerbals which which is which is not good um what else to say oh yeah this is kerbal space program 0.23.5 which comes with the asteroid redirect mission and that's introduced a lot of new parts to the game which i'll be using um, in addition to that, I've been modding the hell out of this now, and I've actually reached the limit. I've reached my memory limit, which means I've had to take a few off, because it was crashing every time I tried to go back to the space hangar. Um, so yeah, it was it was B9 Aerospace that was pushing it over, so I'm playing without that now. Uh, in the bottom, there'll be a full list of all the mods I'm using. Last time, we launched uh, the Sputnik kind of analog for this series, and this time we're going to be going on the Lunar series of Soviet missions which we're trying to trying to get to the moon. This one will be Luna 1 and Luna 2. Um, Luna 1 originally broke on the launch pad I believe, uh, so Luna 2 was the first one to successfully make it to the moon. And here you can see the rocket that we're going to be using for this one. Um, it looks very similar at the top but actually it's completely different underneath. It's a completely redesign of the rocket we were using to launch the last mission, the Kerbnik probe. And if we look underneath the fairing, you'll see it's pretty much the same probe. We'll show you more about that in space. But further down, you can see it's completely different using KW rocketry parts now, which include a lot more Soviet-looking parts, uh, such as the side tanks down at the bottom here. It's like the original Vostok kind of missions, even though the side tanks was... Well, it's used up until the present day in the Soyuz kind of rockets. Um, so yeah, these are KW rocketry, and they're going to be pushed away when they're empty. There's no fuel crossfeed here, it's all running separately. It's just based on fuel flow um, as to which one runs out first. So we'll be left with this central stack, which again is KW rocketry. Um, a single engine at the bottom will push it, and then when this is empty, this one will drop away using the retro rockets on the stack. And we have a double nozzled engine uh, medium stage, which will take it up and out of the atmosphere. And in to space we'll have this really fuel efficient engine um, for the for the orbital and maneuvering stack which will then deploy the probe from the top of it. The probe itself it's got a uh, spike on the top of it which I'm just going to deploy. This is like the impactor kind of antenna which the lunar probe used. Um, it's got its own propulsion which is different that didn't happen in real life and it's got solar panels um, just so that we can actually use it. This is the original lunar probe. Luna 1 and 2 were exactly the same. Um, and let's just have a look at what it had. So yeah, as it happens, it's really difficult to find a schematic of uh, the insides of Luna 1 and Luna 2. So I've had to use basically a lot of Wikipedia, um, mostly unsighted Wikipedia facts um, to see what it had. But yeah, Luna 1 and Luna 2 were equipped scientifically with a magnetometer, a Geiger counter, something called a scintillation counter, which sounds amazing, and a micrometeorite detector. And those were very similar to the American ones that I talked about in the last episode. It just detected the pings off the metallic surface of the, of the probe. Um, ah, a scintillation counter is an instrument for detecting and measuring ionizing radiation. Because at this at this time, they didn't realize what, what there was in the space between spaces, between... Um, the Earth and the Moon. So, Luna 1 uh, basically missed its missed its mark and shot straight past the Moon and went into inter interplanetary space, orbiting the Sun. Um, Luna 2 was um, more successful. It made contact with the Moon and basically just delivered uh, a plaque of the Soviet coat of arms to the Moon and left it in a massive crater that Luna 2 made on the face of the moon. Uh, yeah, it had exactly the same kind of things, a, Ch a Cherenkov detector, which I believe is also a radiation detector. Yes, it is. Uh, electromagnetic radiation. Um, yeah, it detected on the way out the uh, uh, 
changes in the uh, energy spectrum of the Van Allen radiation belt showed it wasn't a fixed, it was a flowing, ebbing kind of phenomenon. Um, and yeah, the difference between this probe and the one I'm using is that uh, Luna 2 itself had no propulsion stage on it. Its rocket took it all the way to the moon and then just detached and launched it as a dead weight towards the moon after everything was everything was on track to deliver it to the surface. Um, and then the the um, the rocketry stage impacted like 30 minutes later, something like that. Um, and the whole journey was 36 hours, and there was no no space to be left by this mission because everything either returned to Earth quite quickly or, well, made a massive hole on the moon. And here is this beauty on the launch pad. Um, it, everything's lined up for the moon, I believe. Oh, no, it's not lined up for the moon. Now, the trick here is to try and get the red dot of the space center so it's just lining up with the moon on the horizon that that's optimal for you to just launch straight towards the moon and you'll hit it eventually and here's the launch We've gone right up to full throttle there should there probably will be some overheating i'm using massive engines on this and yeah the overheating's happening i'm gonna leave it on full throttle it, it's, it's creeping up slowly and i'm I've done a few test test launches and it looks like I can not worry too much about the overheating. Just pitch over slightly because I don't want everything to fall back down on the space center. And yeah, things are looking pretty good. It's quite a stable rocket, nothing's wobbling about, and that's partially thanks to the new uh, the new changes in point three no point two three point five. The wobbling on the top of the engine stacks has, has been reduced. And here we get ready for separation. Now the real uh, Soyuz rockets do this in real life. They have this thing called the Russian Star. There we go. Oh, crap. Not Well, not, not perfect. It's created a lot of debris, but, you know, it looked pretty. And there you can see the moon on the horizon. That shows that we are perfectly in line to do it. Okay, so now we know everything goes well, and uh, nothing explodes, we can actually launch it. For real this time, that, that, that was a simulation. Um, yeah, crap. Yeah, I forgot to line up the moon for this one. So, um, yeah, this could be a simulation too, let's just forget it. Things are not going as well as it did last video. So let's just bring all the parts back to the back to the launch pad and then we'll set it back up to have another go. But yeah. Okay, I'm going to call that one a staging exercise. We know everything separates properly. And it can impact, which is the point of the mission. So yeah, that was a test as well. Okay, back to launch. Let's not screw it up this time. Let's align things on the horizon. Okay, there we go. Yeah, nighttime launch, and we can see it over there, everything's fine. Throttle up, SAS on. And launching. It is an incredibly overpowered rocket, actually, for the payload it's delivering. Um, which is going to be useful, I guess, when we're doing manned manned launches or crewed launches, seeing as they're Kerbals and not men, I guess. But yeah, it's going to allow us for a lot heavier payload using the same rocket design, which is what happened in real life. They they just put extra stacks on top, extra propulsion stages, just to push things a little bit further, or heavier things, just to push them to the same level as the lighter payloads were being taken to. Very 
very straight solid launch. I'm really happy with this. I'm trying to wonder how I could make the, the Russian starburst kind of work so that it didn't collapse into each other at the end and create a massive explosion. I could lower the propulsion, um, the, the thrust in the in the separation motors, or I don't know, reduce the amount of fuel in them, but I, it doesn't matter really. And here we go. Ooh, really happy not to have that shoot back up and hit me. And I don't know if you want to see the the full launches. I mean, feel free to leave a comment in the in the section at the bottom whether you want to see it from from beginning to end. It's just I thought for a, for maybe a fifteen minute mission, it it's it's worth worth watching. But yeah, feel free to leave feedback on that. I, I I'm I'm new to this. Yeah, now we can pitch down a bit towards the horizon. We're at forty three thousand. We've got plenty of fuel left, so. Another thing to remember is we're not trying to get a circular orbit here. We're trying to push the far side of the orbit out as far as it will go until it intersects with the moon because where we are at the moment means that by the time we get there, the moon will also be there. And the retro engines take that far away from us. There'll be no collision. Fairing away and the medium stage is firing up. Really should have planned this better. It's a bit annoying to be doing this on the dark side especially seeing as there's a long way to go until until the dawn. So I'm going to put some um, B9 rocketry lights on it. They're quite nice, the Omni lights. Might do that next time just in case I have to launch during the night. Saves waiting a, a month of Kerbal time for it to come round into the sun. So deploy the solar panels. The The batteries on the upper stage should, should take us into the daylight without enough, with, without any problems of not having enough energy. And let's deploy the impactor as well. Oh, at the minute. Okay, I can't see what I'm doing. Oh yeah, they're the communicatrons going out just because um, they've got a longer range for communicating back to the space center. Remember I'm doing everything here with the um, communication mods installed, so if I've not got a direct line of sight back to the space center, I'm screwed. And also when I get beyond a certain range, I'm also screwed because um, they've got a limited omnidirectional range, meaning when I get towards the moon, I've just got to fire and forget. I can't actually make any changes to it that, that far in. See, what you haven't seen here is me spending maybe five hours on this, trying to get the launch exactly right, enough fuel in the stages that I can get enough velocity into my into my path towards the moon so close to the surface that I'm actually still in contact with the space center. I, I can't make these changes up in orbit. Uh, here we are into the very very fuel efficient slow stage. I'm getting a bit worried now because if I get too far around the orbit I won't have anything to give me control over the vehicle and as you can see the, the lowest point of the orbit is still within the atmosphere so I can't go around and try next time. But yeah, nothing to worry about. It looks like we've got enough fuel and plenty of fuel in this actually. Yeah, just gonna have to deploy that and hope it burns up again. Should do seeing as the lowest point was already was already in and the decoupling has pushed me out beyond the moon. Oh no, it's pushed me into a collision with the moon. That's brilliant. I don't even need the propulsion stage on this. Well, in that case I don't I'm feeling a bit annoyed I didn't do it more realistic to life. I could have not included that small engine and the the fuel tank on that, the toroidal fuel tank. Oh well. So yeah, now I'm going to use the flight computer to keep it uh, pointed prograde so that hopefully the impactor should be the thing that hits the surface first. I mean, this can be explained away in saying that it had some kind of gyroscope in it or that it was pointing in the right direction upon decoupling. But yeah, that's that's where we're going to. We're going to the moon. So it's time warp ahead because it's a long, long way. It's 36 hours in real life. It'll be about five hours in Kerbal time, I think. Um, 
And yeah, I'm losing connection, which shouldn't be a problem as long as the, the autopilot's got its orders. It should revert to the orders as long as there's power going into it. So yeah, if I go back to regular warp, yes, it still adjusts. And we're still on track to hit the moon. Brilliant, that's actually worked out quite well. The moon's getting incredibly close now, where it's, what's that, seven and a half hundred meters per second? And it should only get faster as we get towards the surface. So, yeah. It's going to be quite a big impact, quite a powerful impact. It does look really pretty though, and I've been playing with the, the graphic settings on this to try and get a sm smoother recording. So the, the terrain won't be as good as And it's really quite nail-biting stuff. I mean, everything looks like it's going to be lined up fine. Um, it's just a case of where it's going to hit and, and uh, trying to make sure that I can get it filmed. Still really annoyed about having all of this fuel left. It's it's quite annoying that I could have gone for more realism. Should see the ground scatter start to pop into focus in a minute. Oh, you can see the shiny... What? Is that a glitch? Is that graphics glitch? Wait. What? What the f? Okay, guys, so here's what's happened. You remember right at the beginning of the video, I told you that I reached my memory limit on Kerbal Space Program? Well, it so happened that uh, in the previous recording, when I left the video, it basically screwed up Fraps. Fraps kept recording, um, but it didn't keep recording the, the actual image that was being processed through my video card. So, tried it again, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording before I press escape. That was my problem. Because I've done a reload from the quick save, I am no longer pointing towards where I should be doing on the autopilot. But I hope you can forgive me that. Um, and then, yeah, by the next time I'll have B9 completely removed. It was that or the, the, the Kerbin Prettier mod, but either one pushed it over. The, but I prefer the enhanced clouds and things than I do to airplane parts. And I'm not exactly in the, the timeline for using airplane parts yet, so maybe when it comes to reusable shuttles, I'll, I'll think about switching that round. But yeah, here we go. Ground scatters initialized and nothing's happening. This isn't fast forwarded. I'm really going that fast and bang. That's the explosion. Successful mission. We've completely trashed a spaceship, and that's a success, apparently. So there we go, that's where we impacted on the moon, in some nondescript flatlands part of it between craters. Oh, it looks brilliant, doesn't it? Well, I hope I'll see you for my next video. My next video will be Luna 3, and that's taking photographs of the far side of the moon. Leave any comments you would like in the in the section at the bottom. I love the feedback, and I do need it. I'm still starting out, so anything you would like to see... Um, just let me know, and I will see you next time.